Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Hero Hero Go Show. I am Bo Ranstall. With me on a continuing journey as we look at the One Miss Call series is the uh, the lovely, the talented, uh, the the musically apt Derek Bourgeois. This is the end, beautiful friend, the end. Yeah, it really feels like we have come to the end of a thing. Um and a much longer thing, uh, thanks to the television series, but, um, yeah, we've been for about what, two months now we've been talking about the one missed call movies. Yeah. It seems like that, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that's accurate. So, um, we're gonna, I, as I was telling Derek before we started the show, we're going to do things a little bit different than we normally do. Um, we're going to run through the synopsis real, real fast. And by run through the synopsis, I mean a handful of sentences. And then we're going to kind of dive into one missed call final, um, which I'm going to say up front, Derek, maybe the most slashery of the movies. The way I thought of it, it's the most final destination of these movies. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, it definitely has that vibe to it. And I would argue like Mimiko is in it about four minutes more than I am. And, yeah. You know, it like, she's there and kind of hovering in the background and there's some stuff with Mimiko, but mostly it's just kind of like these teenagers running afoul of the supernatural. Like it, it's a win, one missed call movie to be sure, but you change a couple of things and you could totally make this a, a different kind of movie. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, we're not going to get into it. Like, I was just shocked at teenagers fucking over other teenagers in this movie. You know, dude, that's uh, far and away my favorite part of all of this, which we will <laughs> we will get into a, a little bit in detail. This is uh, directed by uh, Manabu Aso, um, who really has done a lot of like television miniseries and TV series and stuff like that. Not a, not a ton of movies that we would be familiar with from, you know, the hero hero point of view. And yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I was looking through his filmography the other day and it looked like some like teen romance stuff, which Kind of makes sense of some aspects of this movie. You know? Well, yeah. And to be fair, like Japanese television, especially modern Japanese television and Korean television too, is just romance dramas. You know, yeah. it, it, that is not that uncommon. Um, I would like to see the, you know, Takashi Miike romance drama series. That would be a good time. Uh, Sion Soto <laughs> kind of did his with, uh, Tokyo Vampire Hotel. Yeah. Uh, um, that, that was pretty great. <laughs> and that, that is surprisingly like Twin Peaks season three in that you'll just kind of jump into different stories here and there. And it uh, like, we'll get into, uh, Tokyo Vampire Hotel at a, at a future date, but that is, uh, if you have not watched it, I think both of us would give it a hearty recommendation. That's, you know, Seon oh, yeah. Sono playing around with vampire stuff, and that ain't that ain't too bad. Oh yeah. Uh, so a couple of cast members, uh, Asuka or Asuka, um, is played by Maki Horikita, and she is kind of known. Um, for uh like a little bit of modeling mostly as a lot of these actors are and then um a ton of television but the thing i wanted to point out is that she is the voice uh of luke triton in the professor layton video game oh really yeah and also did some work in like the uh phoenix Wright ace attorney stuff so she does some some voice work for video games which I thought was kind of fun. And uh, and then there's uh, Mesa Kuroki, who is, is sort of one of the other leads. And she um, it was in a lot of, like, the Lupin uh, films. So, you oh. know, a few, a few actors running around that you might have seen before. But not a ton. It's, it's not 
like stacked with actors that you know well. It's a lot of a lot of teenagers. And yeah. and we've got uh a Korean boyfriend back for this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's fun. Uh, but yeah, all right. So let's let's just kind of give the synopsis of the movie and then we'll we'll just kind of briefly discuss the plot here so the official synopsis according to the good folks at imdb is the timid young Asuka is bullied by her her classmates when they embark on a class field trip to korea Asuka plans revenge by sending them a cursed phone message they can either pass on or die and and so that's the setup is we're going to to Korea on this field trip and uh, all of the teenagers are just the worst. Oh yeah. <laughs> like they're all just like assholes and jocks and, you know, constantly uh, like snapping selfies of themselves and just the worst. Like if you saw this pack of teenagers, I don't care what country they hail from. You're going to cut a wide berth. It's just yeah. a bunch of like hormones and and angst, all in a big ball. Yeah, I, I kind of like that aspect of the movie though because it kind of dwells back into the first film a little bit more than the second film did, where it actually has like a hidden message within it, more precise than say the second film did, which felt kind of bogged down and convoluted. This is not perfect by any means. But I'm at least glad that they tried to do an underlying message of like school boiling and you know in this movie, you know. Yeah, it has a real Lord of the Flies kind of vibe to it. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, right. Like the ultimate message of this movie is don't bully, which is not the most sophisticated in a movie. But like you said, after coming off one missed call two, you know, which I guess the message of that was try to save your girlfriend i guess <laughs> uh so you know it, it maybe not uh wowing you with uh, subtext uh one miss call two but one miss call three so you know it's these kids traveling to korea there is the deaf korean boyfriend that is sort of our protagonist has um who we later learn is kind of in the know on all this stuff like he apparently dated one of the one missed call victims from previous films yeah which i'm trying to think which one because well in the second one they said it had happened in korea so i'm kind of assuming the girl that he dated was just part of that pack and i don't know that we saw her in a film but you know, maybe our listeners could potentially uh, correct us on this, and I will certainly issue a correction if somebody's like, "No, dumb dumb, that was that was the guy who dated so and so from part two or something." But I think yeah. it's more just like, "Oh, hey, when this was going on in Korea, uh, as, as like I said, as we learned in one miss call two, that this just was a thing that he he was on the periphery of." Like he, cause he was trying to intercept the call. That's his whole gig is like, oh, if you intercept a call that belongs to somebody else, you can die in their place and save them. And I kind of wish I had done that with my girlfriend who is yeah. no longer with us. Yeah. Which is the only thing they did bring back from part two, which it, it kind of, I kind of like it better in this movie because it's kind of works a little bit better in that sense because of the reaction. I kind of like the chemistry between these two people more than the characters in the second film. I, I just like the aspect that they actually have a deaf character. It's actually kind of interesting that aspect, and he actually made himself deaf, right? Yeah, of his mistake. You yeah, know? that that was the whole thing, right? Like he he thought if he could never hear the ring, he'd be safe or whatever. And 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 we find out at the very end of the movie when they're like were you that little boy who, who stabbed his ears out? And he's like, yes. Um, but yeah, it, it so I, I agree with you. I like that aspect a lot. I like the character, um, whose name is, let me get it on Jew, uh, on Jinu rather. 
and he is uh he's got like a little girl sidekick who is also deaf and they like the main girl that's kind of down with uh uh our protagonist like she is she thinks that this dude is her boyfriend or certainly is flirting with him and all of her friends uh-huh. are like oh he's cute but i don't know that he's really romantic with her at any point he i think i i don't think he's against it or anything but he's not pushing the issue at all i think he cares about her but the over well i think he cares about her enough to sacrifice himself for her, you know in that sense we we're spoiler alert we got to that point already he, yeah. he ends up killing him you know but you know i I think he grew to like her to the end, you know. I don't think he was really into her at the beginning more. <laughs> yeah. Because they were just pen pals, you know. Right. Like, he shows up at the, the museum or whatever when they arrive and gives her the wave. And she's like, oh, hey, I got to go with this school trip. And he's like, all right, peace. And then he's gone for a little while until he shows back up and is like, did you say one missed call? Um, But, but so then we have our like I said, a group of teenagers that have come from Japan to Korea, they're all terrible. They're all just backstabbing, uh, awful people. And so there is this girl, Asuka, that uh, was being bullied. And she has come into possession of the power of the one miss call, where she all she has to do is click on the the person in a school picture and their face goes all warped and then they get one miscalled and so, yeah and go ahead i'm sorry i was just, i was just gonna say mimico is just like yo this girl's gonna be my fucking gateway she's like free cougar in this movie i need you to give me more of them you know <laughs> like, right. you know it's great and that's it and you know it's it's weird because well it's not too weird it happened in the tv series the internet is the main database of Mimico's spawn and <laughs> virus. Yeah, which leads to to maybe the dumbest thing for me in the movie, but we'll we'll mm-hmm. hold off on that for a second. Um, so right, so Mimico, it, it, like again, spoilers for all of this, of course, but it turns out that like Asuka is in a coma and has been having these dreams where like Mimico is like, hey, if you hate those kids, I can send them a phone call that'll really fuck them up. (laughs) And Asuka, who has been, you know, bullied to the point where she's in a coma, uh, is like, totally, we should kill all these kids. And the wrinkle, uh, as we mentioned, is that you can forward the call. Like, you can, if if I get the one missed call, I could forward it to you. I'd be cool, and then you're going to die. And so... Yeah, go on. I was just gonna, I was gonna say that's the aspect of it that kind of reminds me of Final Destination, where it's kind of like Final Destination Five, where if you kill somebody else, it bounces. You could actually live longer, you know. In that oh, sense, <laughs> yeah, I still contend. Not, I look. I know this is an Asian horror, but this is an important discussion to have. I still contend that Final Destination, pound for bound the best horror series in film. Like, yeah, I really like it. There's only one movie that I do not like in that series, and that's part four, which is, I think, the one that everyone says they don't like. So, yeah, I really like that series. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are greater highs in other series, like, mm-hmm. you know, Halloween and Friday the 13th and stuff like that, but as far as just consistently being okay to good movies... Final Destination, hands down the winner. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> send all your uh, angry letters about that. Letters. Angry messages to uh, Derek Bourgeois. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you heard him, folks. He said he agreed. Um, but so much of the movie is Asuka, like, you know, they kind of sniff out pretty quickly that, you know, there's this supernatural phone call thing happening, as well as the new rule of, oh, I can forward this to you, and you'll die instead of me. And and a lot of the movie, then, is just them backstabbing each other and killing each other off. 
And the downside, Derek, is I don't think the kills are very good in this movie. Yeah, yeah, they're they're very cheap. That's that's probably the one downside of the movie. You know, there's some good build up to them, but then you know, like like yeah, like I really wanted to see that little nerdy kid get killed in the closet. <laughs> no shit, no shit, and. <laughs> There were a couple of the girls that, you know, like passed it on and so forth. It was like, oh, you're a horrible person. I want to see you murdered terribly. And it kind of never happens. Um, You get a couple of the, you know, like crumpling uh, of a human body a little bit. But even that feels kind of chintzy. And it feels a little toothless, especially coming off of um, not just the television series, which actually did have some more creative and kind of inventive deaths i thought but going back to the original mike one miss call like i know that it's a sequel and we're too deep in uh, on sequels at this point but it feels like a, like a pg-13 horror film as opposed to one miss call being r and i don't know if that's the case but it sure feels like that yeah i definitely think that it's something to do with the budget of the movie and you know, like the one big set piece is the electric wire coming down, CGI style, oh. and choking that guy out. You know, which I kind of liked, even though you know, I like it's like asylum level CGI, but it, it kind of cracked me up because I was not expecting it. <laughs> that yeah, that one was pretty funny. I like the fact that he gets the uh, the power line to the face, <laughs> which sounds way better than it is. Again, that, that like I'm. A lot of the, the the statements I'm going to make are just a series of disappointments of like, I wish all of this had been, you know, 30% cooler and I would have been really down for this movie uh, because yeah. I do like the setup and I, I like the this new wrinkle of, oh, I can, you know, I, I can cornhole you uh by just forwarding the the message or the phone call i I like that aspect of it a lot i just wish any of those deaths had kind of paid off yeah Uh, but yeah especially the teacher especially the teacher like i like the aspect when the teachers like even being a douchebag and trying to backstab people oh they're all terrible (laughs) yeah yeah because the teacher immediately is like i don't like any of you you know he like (laughs) i that part of it is a lot of fun, but there's also the thread of like the main character and, and her Korean boyfriend sort of like, like you said, they're kind of forming this relationship throughout the film. And so we, every time something like there's some momentum for the movie, it seems like it just decides that, Hey, we're just going to shut everything down for a little while and pursue this romance story that nobody cares about. Uh, yeah. so, so the, the culmination of all of this is that, uh, we find out, you know, there's the revelation that Asuka, who you see at the computer the whole time is in fact, not at the computer. She's actually in the hospital that it's Mimiko who is sort of, like you said, kind of Freddy Kruegering th- via the Freddy versus Jason method of, I'm going to find this person and they're going to sort of be my my Make proxy. them remember. <laughs> right. Yeah, it turns out poor Asuka is all loaded up on hypnocil and um, you <laughs> got to get Buster out of the did, spring did I tell you that? center. I was going to say, you know, it cracked me up when they were starting to do research on it, and they actually found Mimico's death tape on the fucking internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the internet has everything, Derek. It does. Uh, that is pretty good. Cool. <laughs> the in we, right, like I said, th- this is coming to the point where I'm like, all right, here's kind of where my big problems with this movie begin. But one, <laughs> so th- they find out that Oscar is in a coma, but she wakes up in time because she and the protagonist we learn were big buddies when they were kids, uh, all up through high school. And the protagonist was getting bullied and Asuka was befriending her. But as soon as our main character had an opportunity to join the cool kids, she completely fucked Asuka over 
and and started bullying her too and if not outright bullying certainly hanging with the crowd that did all the bullying uh which of course led to you know oscar uh distraught uh trying to take her own life and yeah. go on i was just gonna say like you know that whole setup like when they see show, they show her being bullied in the beginning of the movie and they're just pouring water on her head and, and she's locked in the bathroom and it goes right to the chicken coop where she hangs herself it's like whoa dude i guess the, the opening salvo of this bull, bullying is just dumping buckets of water on her while she's in the stall of a bathroom the best part of that scene for me is the girl that's like second bucket coming you know <laughs> don't even worry about it. we ain't stopping at one you're gonna you're gonna be soaked before you leave that stall yeah and then she and yeah there's all the stuff about like when she go, hangs herself in the in the chicken coop there's all the stuff about like pecking order and that uh all the chickens in a coop will you know the pecking order is who gets pecked right like who who is pecking yeah. you who are you pecking and you get down to the last chicken that has nobody to peck and so chickens peck it and it just pecks the ground and yeah you know it's a fine metaphor for bullying and so forth and that you know oscar represented that last chicken that you know gets picked on but doesn't have anybody beneath her to abuse to make her herself feel better and uh, so she wakes up in time to kind of confront Mimiko, but in the process of this, there is this whole business where uh, they reach out to the internet as a whole. Like, the, the, the way that they're going to stop Mimiko, because she's using the internet to just get Just break the internet. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It's like, we're just going to do a DDoS attack on this email address and we're going to shut down the internet pipe uh, from this computer to the outside world. Cause you know, of course, Mimico is like, you know, today, this group of shitty teenagers tomorrow, the world, I'll be unstoppable as a, a vengeance ghost. And, and we get a handful of, like when people get killed, uh, it doesn't happen up front because we don't want to spoil anything, I guess, but you know, they're, uh, dropping those red candies out of their mouth and so forth you know again kind of when it's convenient it doesn't do it in yeah the goings but towards the end of the movie everybody's got a red candy i do like that aspect that they brought back the red candy because i missed it in the second film though absolutely absolutely uh i wish there had i i wish this this had been more of a one miss call movie i wish there was a yeah. lot more mimico shit i wish there were more red candies I wish we had yet another surly, grizzled detective on the case, you know, tracking Mimiko down from Japan to Korea again and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I I would have taken Ghost Detective. He died in the second one. Bring him back. Make him be a ghost detective. Yeah, that would have been awesome. I mean, Ghost Detective be Mimiko? Now you got a movie. Hell yeah. Uh, But yeah, so... You know, they the, the, there's the big denial of service attack, and the internet wins, and Mimico just kind of, you know, jiggles and goes staticky and disappears. Yeah, and that's, you know, he, she, she ends up killing the deaf guy at the very end, though, because she could still kill people near her that right. she already calls. Right, you know, but yeah, she get she gets him and. Uh, our protagonist is saved, and Aska sur- survives too, right? D- don't both of them survive? Today? Yeah, yeah, they're the, the very which I kind of I did like that they made up at the end. You know, it, it kind of made that part of the movie. I actually did enjoy their aspect of their old previous relationship. Mm-hmm. I did like that they ended up making up and becoming friends again, and her taking care of her. Well, uh, yeah, Asuka seems to be doing fine. The other girl is, like, catatonic and freaked out. Uh, In a wheelchair and shit. All we know is, like, Asuka is probably hobbling her and shit. Right, doing a full, like, Annie Wilkes on her. You're you're a big duty head for abusing me all those years. Let me me just put this piece of wood between your your ankles. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, and that, so that's kind of the story of the movie, and and we've touched on some of this, but I, like my my overarching issue with the film as a whole like I said, is that it feels kind of toothless. Um, it's not as much a one miss call as I would, uh, movie as I would like it to be. And I don't think any of the deaths are really great. You know, like, like you said, the centerpiece scene of this movie is sort of that wire falling and hitting that, uh, you know, bleach haired dude and, uh, and killing him as opposed to, you know, that incredible television studio scene in the first one. And even the second one had, you know, I, like, I, I, I'm not saying it was executed great, but sort of that descent into the mines and all that stuff at least felt like you were really pushing the action forward. And I don't know that I got the feeling, uh, the, or the same feeling from this one. It, it felt a little more tedious than the other two to me for some reason. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think the thing was, I, I was just more engaged with it because it was more paced better. To it, it, this movie flew by for me. Yeah, you know yeah. In that aspect, which you know, which kind of made up for like some of the downfalls of it, in my opinion. You know, I, I had fun with this one. I'm not gonna say it's a, per- it's definitely not a perfect movie. Like we touched on the things that it does wrong. But overall, I think it's a better watch. It yeah, for people it's, getting into it. It's breezy. I all right. So before we get into ranking these movies up, because I do want to do that, I just kind of want to talk about like where one miss call fits in in terms of Japanese horror series. You know, because you've got your uh, your Juans, you got your Ringus. You know, you've got some really classic kind of horror series. And where does one miss call land for you? Like in, in taking, we'll exclude the television show for right now, but just from the three movies, uh, how do you feel about the series as a whole? Uh, I like two of the movies up front, you know, <laughs> he you gets, know so you it know. gets a 67% on, yeah, on, you on know, it's grading. Yeah. I, I like two of the movies. And I like them for different reasons. Yeah, the third one doesn't feel like a one miss call movie, but overall, I had fun watching it. And, you know, I kind of like the aspect of Mimico being like a Freddy Cougar in the third, which makes sense because that's a, the third one. That's when Freddy started to become make me remember. You know? uh, but you know, I like that kind of shit. It's, it's stupid, but I like it. It's my kind of stupid, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, but uh, yeah, you know, this is the second one. Let's, I, you know, just the multiple ghosts angle didn't fucking, it was kind of confusing. Like we talked about in that one, if they just had that one scene that they cut out of the movie, I might have been okay with that aspect of the movie. But it's like when you're watching it without knowing that, it's like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know, but in this one, it, it, it it has a guideline. It has a basic structure. It's basic and easy in that sense. Where in the second one, the first one is just a classic, in my opinion. You know, yeah. It, you know, so overall, it's an okay series. I wouldn't say it would be my go-to, like to start with. Like if you want to, the marathonies, I would say just watch part one and three over, and then you know. But I wouldn't recommend part two. But, you know, I would go to, the, like, Juwan and Ringo first in the series. Well, I, I would actually don't know because I haven't seen any of those Sadako 3D movies, so I can't really judge those movies, it's you know. It's not bad. Like, the, the Kayako versus Sadako has some really fun stuff in oh, it. Oh, yeah, I, I do love that one, yeah. You know, so, yeah, I would ring Ringo and Juwan over One Miss Call, but I would still recommend these, like, after you watch those. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think you and I probably come down very similarly. Where I think the original one miss call, it, it, I, yeah, that's a total masterpiece. That's just a banger of a movie, and and I don't expect everything else in the series to be that good, uh, just because you know Takashi Miike didn't do the other films, and that guy is just a mad genius. Yeah, 
but it reminds me a lot of uh, another series we did recently when Richard uh, was on doing all of the I films, where the first movie, it, I mean, it's not the banger that One Miss Call is, but it's a, a pretty solid movie and it has a really strong ending. It, it, it's a movie that kind of sticks the landing real well and that makes the rest of the movie a lot better. Uh, but you know, the, the I two and especially the I three, when it just gets straight up goofy, you know, it always felt like they were just trying to figure out what to do with that series. And I, I, I feel like one missed call was sort of a one missed opportunity, (laughs) um, (laughs) because they, they jump straight into the sequel of like, Hey, we're going to have this. Uh, these dual ghosts it's you know we're gonna extend the mythology out and that kind of thing and then by the time you get to the third one they're just like no 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 fuck all that we're just gonna you know play it a lot cleaner and simpler this time and as a result it feels disconnected like it doesn't feel like a series of movies in the same way that friday the 13th or something like that does even though you've got you know for two of the three movies you've kind of got the same villain but yeah uh, uh. Uh, yeah the, the thing with the i movies is they're all from the same directors too which is kind of fucked up that they went into like all these different fucking directions with those fucking movies which it makes more sense with these because they hired these directors like for the cheaper budget movies that they made for these katakawa i think made these ones yeah fucking oh uh they because they hired TV directors to do the sequels, which, you know, they could work on lower budgets, which I, I feel like that's what happened with these. They just cut the budgets on these movies, and that's why they're like this. If they had the budgets that they could, they could probably have made movies like the original. Yeah, I think there's something a little more cynical about it, where it's yeah. like, oh, we're going to make a one missed call movie because that first one was such a big hit. And we can make a few bucks off of this. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to something like, like Ringu feels like it's telling an entire story. That series, like it gets super weird and crazy sci-fi uh, in the later, like, you know, Ring Zero and even Rasen and stuff like that. Uh, but it it all feels of a piece, you know, it all, it all feels like it, it's all cut from the same cloth. And one missed call, and I think you're right. I think the the eye uh, also has that sort of schizophrenic kind of feeling to it, where it's like, well, it's all kind of right, you know, like it, all of this kind of fits together, but it, it only in as much as it needs to to get the movie made. Yeah, especially when you get the I three where they try to connect the other two movies with the part three with that fucking book that they. Fuck. Oh my god, like that whole s- sequence with the, uh, like farting a- at the ghost to keep them at bay, that was the point where it was like, oh, okay, we just don't care anymore. You yeah, know? like, let's just get Naburo Gucci to direct this scene. If only it would have been, like, super gory and fun, or, uh, yeah. Yoshihiro Nishimura or somebody like that, like, one of those knuckleheads that just does the craziest most outlandish movies like uh side note i have been following the nishimura facebook updates as he is prepping his next movie and i i'm very excited to see oh, yeah. what is, what is going to come out of that man's head it it already when he was like oh yeah we're doing a, a lot of like foam casting and stuff like that i was like oh so this is going to be yet another splatter film fantastic Keep up the good work. Yeah, I'm just I just can't wait for that fucking great Yuko Yuko High War yeah. Part Two to come out. Nikkei, yeah, like, made a sequel to the movie he made like 15, 16 years ago. Like, and he has Diamond Gin in it. Like, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which, by the way, uh, for listeners of this show, um, we will soon be diving into the Diamond Gin series with one quartz psyops so not nice i actually just ordered the box set so yeah i can't wait to hear your guys thoughts on those movies yeah uh fyi uh for those listening i think it's july 25th is when that box set is landing 
but right around the corner, like a completely remastered box set of all the Diamogen stuff, and uh, I'm very excited. Uh, the Arrow, I, th I think Arrow already has those on their streaming platform. I think so too. Yeah. Uh, which I mean, if you want to get a little Diamogen early, uh, a Diamogen early and a dollar short, you know what I'm saying? That's gonna be a T-shirt on the <laughs> Legion T-shirt page. If only it made sense. Uh, it would be great. Um, but yeah, I, so I'm, I'm kind of with you when I, when I'm thinking about one missed call as a series, I really do think it's a, a case of, Hey, here is a one great movie. And then here are two movies that if you feel like you're a completionist, maybe you, you check them out. But I don't, I don't think it hangs with like the great, I would probably put the I series above the one missed call series just because there's a little more consistency and you get uh the great line uh your wife uh, uh your your ex-wife is going to be our our baby uh which is one of my favorite things to ever happen in a movie uh, yeah but plus the i plus the i has the better american remake uh yeah, I mean, both of them are. Yeah, they're, garbage, they're, both, they're both bad, but you know, if I had to choose one, it's definitely the eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. It, it's probably better. Maybe the most offensive to me personally is that Shutter remake. Oh, don't, don't get me started on that fucking. That feels like a movie that was made by people who just did not understand what made Shutter good, even in the slightest. Yeah, they, they totally ruined the ending. It was... Oh. the Yes, the ending of Shudder is one of the most horrifying things uh, in cinema. And, yeah, and they completely ruined it. And I even like Josh Jackson. I'm a, I'm a Josh... Uh, isn't that his name? Joshua Jackson? Yeah. I'm a, I'm an apologist for him. I think he's an okay actor. He could have been great in that role as... as yeah, he was great in Fringe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh... <laughs> that's a show coming so coming soon Derek and Bo go through fringe <laughs> look it's not the craziest thing I've ever heard uh the one thing I remember about fringe is especially in the last season where it just went off the fucking rails uh, yeah but but kind of in a great way like there was just a point where they were like we gotta we gotta keep pushing the envelope somehow some way and so we're just gonna do it with as much interdimensional nonsense as we can Oh yeah. Uh, when it, like, didn't Anna Torv have to go undercover in the other dimension for a while? I think so. It's been a while since I watched those later seasons. Oh man, that feels like a thing that happened. It was real stupid. Yeah, my favorite episode is when Peter Weller was a time traveler. It was amazing. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't like, remember that one clearly. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Well, great. All right. Well, we may have to go back and rewatch those. Um, but to kind of bring this all home. Uh, on, on our conclusion to the one miss call series, um, I let let's do some ranking here. And all right. I want to. All right, uh, just to to add a degree of difficulty, tell me your rank of the three movies, and then tell me where the TV show fits into that list. My ranking is one, three, two. But then if I put the TV in sh show, it would be number two. So it would be one missed call, the TV show, and number two, one missed call three, and then one missed call two. Okay, I'm with you. I'm trying to think if, if, if I would change that order any. I would definitely go one missed call uh, first. The question is, is two better than three or vice versa? I'm starting to come around on the idea that three is maybe better because a it's shorter and b all of the characters are terrible and they don't die as terribly as you want, but there is a pretty good body count. Yeah, you know, like they again. I just wish any of the kills were more like memorable and and interesting. And one miss call three would be a legitimate contender to be like hey, hey this is a movie you should absolutely watch um 
You know what I also the I didn't mention it when we were talking about the but you know the other thing I liked about three? What's they that? brought back the asthma pump. Oh that's for why sure. it's better. <laughs> yeah. I, or, yeah, so I like the fact that they're like, hey Mimico, um, you know, you can be at peace now because we have like established this empathetic bond or something. But it's like, do you guys not know who you're dealing with? Mimico doesn't care about that. She's not worried about people understanding her. She's yeah, it was a totally, yeah, it was a totally like that whole scene. It was like Poltergeist three, which cracked me up. <laughs> yeah. I'll move you to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> it's it yeah, it's very, it, it's really funny to me, of uh, that like all of these just god awful characters like backstabbing and and chaotically fighting amongst themselves is sort of mimico's like that's her target and and i i know that she's kind of using asuka as, as her conduit here and that's why they're getting killed but by the end of the movie when like all these kids are in computer labs across the nation of japan or, or korea i guess um just emailing Asuka's account to to shut down her computer. It's like, eh, I don't I don't know that this is a sufficiently like I, I don't know that this is the 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 ending I want. I don't know that the stakes are high enough here. And it's undone a little bit more when you see the translations of what people are writing in these emails where they're just like, hey, you show that you're a what, what what's what don't don't take any shit off ghosts and that's uh, it's not, it's not, hey we we just watched godzilla versus kong where they stopped from, spoiler alert mega godzilla would all call well come on <laughs> the the original king kong versus godzilla mm -hmm. uh with with junky king kong is mm -hmm. absolutely my favorite uh maybe my favorite in the godzilla series because it's got it, a couple of good fights um it's got a whole lot of tail pulling i like king kong just hurling rocks at godzilla's noggin for a while all it, of that stuff is fantastic you know which one i always go back to from the newer movies is godzilla versus mega garris <laughs> did you ever see that one oh from the uh i can't remember the, the, millennium, the millennium series millennium series I don't think I have. Oh, my, my, the Millennium cool. series is a little spotty for me. I need to. I need to uh, go back through that. Okay, but Bo, this is great. This is great. They build a device called the. I forget the name of it, but it's pretty much a gun that shoots black holes, and they shoot a black hole to Godzilla, <laughs> try to kill Godzilla. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So this is going to sound like sacrilege. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was spending the day with my young nephew, who's four years old. Mm -hmm. And we were, of course, uh, talking about Godzilla. Because he was not very familiar, other than the HBO stuff. And I, and he was like, yeah, I, li I like when Godzilla beats people up. And I was like, you want to see Godzilla and King Kong fight a little more? And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I showed him the OG King Kong versus Godzilla, the Toho one. And he was just fascinated. Like, it, it, it clearly caught his imagination some. And then, this is the sacrilege part. That that part is will hold up in any court in the land. The problem came when I was like, you know, Godzilla has a son. And he, he was like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah. And so I showed him the scene, uh, or a couple of the scenes, where Godzilla and, and baby Godzilla are fighting uh the spider uh, yeah. that is like webs up baby godzilla and whatnot and uh i shouldn't ever show anyone son of godzilla but it wasn't the whole movie in my defense and also he's four and uh i don't know that he's fully ready for like you know godzilla versus biolante or anything like that <laughs> no but, but i like i've got my hooks in them and I, like this is my feeling as an uncle where i'm just like gotcha like now i know when you come over to you know spend the night or hang out or whatever i can be like hey xander 
you want to watch some Godzilla? And he'll be down for it. And I'm, I, well, I she get, she get the sea monster one. That That's actually a pretty fun one for a kid. Yeah, for sure. It's really bright and colorful and it's got some go-go dancers and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I, is that sea monster? No, no, no. I'm thinking of smog monster. Sorry. Uh, sea monster also very good. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm excited because I'm, I'm, almost at the point where I can start showing him those movies and he really gets into it. Uh, so not having kids of my own, Derek, anytime I can corrupt the youth of my family, uh, in, in visits where I'm like, Hey, by the way, your kid really wants to go to Disney world and he loves Godzilla now. See you later. Oh yeah. Uh, so I create a little mini me. Let, let my brother deal with that. Um, Anyway, back to one missed call though. Uh, so yeah, at the end of the day, um, I yeah, I think I would go one missed call as the best of the series. I I think I'm with you that three is probably second best, uh, and then two. But as soon as you bring the television show into the picture, that is absolutely the second best thing. It's you know forever long. It's you know eight hours worth of uh, one missed call television series, but there are you know a couple of down episodes here and there but for the most part they were incredibly entertaining yeah um and and had a secret villain just like I, one miss call three it did yeah i like that yeah yeah i remember really digging that when i watched it. i still have all those so i might rewatch that someday <laughs> oh i'm yes those are never going away until i can get my hands on an actual like physical copy of that thing in blu-ray or something which i don't even know if that's the right way to watch it you know like kind of the grimier version you can get and and the the it's important that the translation isn't very good yeah cuz i know that was part of my my joy uh as as we talked about in those episodes of just like screenshotting the stuff that like sendo would say why would I rape you? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Oh my God. It's, it's the best. Uh, that television show is wonderful. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, like I said, as we're kind of wrapping things up here with the, the one miss call series, um, we're going to be doing a couple of one offs before we get to, uh, to diamond Gym. But, uh, Derek, let me, let me ask you while I got you here. Um, what, what it, would you recommend, not just, uh, you know, above and beyond all the one missed call stuff, but what would you sort of point people to that are personal favorites of yours so that they can invest some time into that before uh, your return, your triumphant return to the show, and I'm sure the not-too-distant future? Sure, I'll, I'll talk about some movies that haven't really been talked about, really. Yeah. I really like... a. Ki Fujiwara's organ from 96. It, uh, it's kind of like this body horror per- police procedural movie. Uh, Ki Fujiwara, of course, was the actress that was in Tessio, the Iron Man, uh, who ended up becoming a director herself. Uh, yeah, and she followed suit and did a lot of body horror movies. I like her movie ID, too. That's one of my favorites to watch. I love... Uh, you know, the Nishimara stuff, Tokyo Gore Police. Uh, I love a lot of the Whispering Corridor movies, besides voice. <laughs> uh, I, but, I I have my, y- yes, it's not the best of the series, but there are still moments in voice that I, I can get behind. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I also, one that's, you know, actually you pointed me to that I really enjoyed was White Melody of the Curse, which... Mm is like a cursed K-pop movie. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, this time I love a lot of the Mikkei stuff. Like we said, like happiness of the category is one of my favorites because it's just bonkers and weird. Uh, I, I dwell into the weird stuff, but I like some of the straightforward stuff too, like Juwan, the grudge, like all that good stuff. You know, I even like a lot of like the older Asian stuff, like, Kerry and Go and uh, Unibaba. I love that kind of stuff, too. I, I just dwell into a lot of Asian cinema and 
I love everything about it because it's just so unique and mind blown to me that this little country made all these crazy movies, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you know, one, one thing that I keep, you know, sort of threatening to do is to expand into, uh, Indian horror films. And cause there's a significant number there that I just, I'm wildly unfamiliar with. Uh, I don't know exactly where to start <laughs> with all that stuff. Uh, but it's something I feel like is a big gap. Like, cause we've done, you know, Thai and Indonesia and, uh, Korea and Japan, certainly and China and Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, you, d- you, you definitely gotta, uh, I, I can't wait for you guys to start doing some Shaw brothers horror movies. Cause those things are nuts. Like the oily maniac and, you know, even I could see you in court doing mighty pecan man in the future. <laughs> Yeah, we're definitely getting it. In fact, the in theory, the next episode, so I don't I don't want to spoil it too much, but in theory, the next episode is going to be a little bit more Hong Kong schlock to, to kind of reset the table before uh, jumping into Dimogen. But yeah, I, you know, like I said, I, I wish that we had sort of world enough and time to get into every every asian region possible but yeah I, especially for india i just feel like it's somewhere i need a guide and i haven't found such a thing that's like here's where you need to start like here are the classics of indian horror cinema here's how you work your way up um but i'm with you there's something really i don't know if it's a clubhouse feeling to some extent where you say like oh i enjoy uh like japanese or korean movies or both or whatever just asian horror and it's 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 certainly off the beaten path um and i wonder if the exclusivity of people who know about this stuff you know there there is something to be said for that sensation of feeling like you have a uh kind of a secret movie that you know is amazing and no one else knows about yeah and and maybe there's just a greater likelihood that you're going to run into a movie like that when you're exploring other countries. You know, uh, everybody's seen all the '80s American shit, but how many people have seen like the weird, you know, like late '70s, like you were saying, the Shaw Brothers, like Hong Kong kind of craziness. Um, and you know, I I, I think that it, it it makes it for a worthwhile pursuit, and also it's just you're going to see movies that you you couldn't possibly anticipate you know uh like evil dead trap is one that i keep thinking about of like that is one of the craziest like japanese giallos you'll ever see and it's it's bonkers but as soon as you start to kind of contextualize it within the culture it makes a lot more sense it's no less bonkers but it, it is really fun for me personally to to sort of, you know, peel back the layers of what the fuck on some of these movies and be like, oh, OK, well, this is why it, it seems crazy to Western eyes. But for a Japanese audience, it actually plays a little more mainstream. Um, that, of course, does not apply to Aguchi and Nishimura and those guys, because their shit is weird no matter where it comes from. Um, yeah. But something like, you know, especially in Japan, a lot of those uh, pink films that are super, like, torture heavy and that kind of thing, where you're like, what is wrong with the Japanese? It's like, well, it, it, you know, it comes from a place. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, like, cultural built-in, you know, misogyny and, and the way that women were just kind of treated historically in Japan and that kind of thing, um, as well as the problems with you know japanese censorship when it comes to nudity and that kind of thing that it you can actually in ratings wise you can get away with stripping a woman nude and beating her with a whip but the second that she gives someone a blowjob like all that's blurred out and you can't see any of it and that kind of thing so yeah yeah i own a few uh (laughs) of those uh uh, movies (laughs) uh women in cage or something uh yeah it was weird because i i didn't actually know because i actually looked it up after 
But there's a scene where they actually show the guy's ass and it just gets censored automatically. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there's a shit ton of that in Japanese film, like Watcher in the Attic. And I mean, I did a review of that movie on my YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was a weird movie. Yeah. I mean, you can go down the list, though. Like, there's. Um, all that in the realms of, of senses yeah. yeah 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 yeah. i mean even stuff like horrors of malformed men and and things like that have uh some of those elements and then i'm trying to remember there's like a trilogy of them that uh i cannot recall the names of off the top of my head but at any rate that are kind of like best in type of of that kind of uh you know torture porn kind of vibe films uh and it's something that i always uh, you know i watch a lot of these movies alone derek and i start to feel real creepy when i'm sitting alone in a house watching a woman get beat on on camera like there's part of me that's like i don't know if this is okay like if somebody showed up right now i'd feel pretty pretty gross that was like when i first watched american guinea pig should i be watching this yeah <laughs> like, uh... And, well, the answer is no. You should absolutely not be watching those guinea pig movies. Uh, what, what, yeah, there's another beyond the guinea pig ones. There's another one I can't think of the name of right now either. But uh, anything that is just like, hey, look at look at these special effects. Most of the time, not interested. Again, unless you're Noboru Aguchi or Yoshihiro Nishimura, in which yeah. case you show me whatever comes into your crazy ass brain. Uh, I know a lot of people did not, you know, wrap their arms around uh, Kataco Meatball Machine, but those people are crazy. That movie is fantastic. Oh, you know, if you ever do Mika Droid, that's when I want to come back. I've yeah, <laughs> I've got that. Um, and, and like, I don't know if it, that's one of those redemption DVDs or if I've actually got a Blu-ray of that. Um, but yeah. At some point, like, I'm going to dip my toes a bit more into those waters with this show. Uh, it just ain't happened yet. and I just can't wait till you do an episode on Def Kappa and change your life. On which one? Def Kappa. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. I thought you said Def Cat for a second. I was like, what the fuck is Def Cat? Why haven't I seen that? Um, <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Like, I, I tried to arrange these episodes in such a way that we don't get too bogged down into one yeah. sort of subgenre but I could I could probably spend a like just on the kaiju subgenre alone like that could be its own show and kind of is you know underwater kaiju from outer space is kind of that um but yeah it's you, you know how crazy Def Kappa gets I don't I've never seen it Hideki Anno plays a Nazi. What? Yeah. There's a secret organization of Japanese Nazis that are making fishmen. Well, naturally. And yeah, it's 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 weird. It's from the same guys who did like Tokyo Gore Police. I can't believe I haven't seen this. All right. Well, I know what I'm doing. Well, not later, but soon. Soon, Derek. That I promise you. <laughs> um hey before we get out of here uh how about you pimp all your stuff tell people where they can find more out of you sure uh you can find me on my main show cinema attack which actually has gone solo we are have one episode out on the new feed which is a tv terrors episode where we looked at the cold check movies we have special guests brian and jamie salmons on that episode great stuff it was a fun time to actually have them on the show uh we're still working on getting some of the older episodes on that feed but actually ironically enough the next episode we are doing godzilla versus kong where yeah there's gonna be a lot of complaints where i'm gonna be like this is a big dumb movie and i'm gonna tell you why uh but uh yeah that's about it for that uh show for now uh you can search for that on most of the podcatchers it's on Spotify right now and uh, Stitcher. And, uh, it's slowly getting on more of them, but keep it up. And, you know, if you go to the main feed of Cinema Attack, 
on the Facebook group. I actually sent the RSS feed. So look for that. Uh, also, uh, No More Room in Hell, uh, which is on the Dark Discussions Network. Uh, we have an episode out where we looked at Dr. Butcher, MD, Medical Deviant, and uh, Bloody Moon. <laughs> I, you know. I always heard, is, is, is that... Are there two Dr. Butchers? Because I feel, I know I've heard of Dr. Butcher. I didn't realize Medical Deviant was part of the title. Uh, it, it's not. It, that, that's just uh, oh, okay. that's from the trailer. The trailer. Uh, fair enough. I, I, I just want to make sure that I had my movies right, but I like it. I like I like the idea yeah. of Medical yeah. Deviant there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just rolls off the tongue after you watch that trailer so many times, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's also Doctor Butcher is also known as Zombie Holocaust, and we paired that up with uh, Jess Franco's Bloody Moon, uh, which is a movie. It's a movie. Uh, we also have There Here, which we have a uh, still working on setting up a date, but we should be our next episode should be on the Poltergeist franchise, which ironically enough, I made a Poltergeist pun earlier, which makes sense why. Yeah, you know? it's on the brain. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, honestly, it has been so long since I've seen Poltergeist three. I couldn't even, I couldn't tell you the the basic plot of it. Yeah, it's kind of like how I feel about uh, the the series. Three is yeah. better than two. <laughs> yeah, Poltergeist uh, two is is a clunker. But like I said, I haven't seen that third one in so long. Uh, with is it Tom Skerritt and Nancy Allen? Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's our leads in that one. I do need to go back and see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh and finally, because I have Blood on from the core also, which is on exclusive to the Legion Patreon. Uh Gary should be putting up the first episode soon on there, uh where we did Michael Winter as the Sentinel. But I'll give you a little heads up of what we're doing next on there. We're gonna also have an episode where we did Larry Cohen's "Cue the Winged Serpent" up on there should oh, be out soon. Yeah, that is a great movie. It, uh, another movie. It's been a long time. I, I keep telling myself I'm going to go back and watch those early Larry Cohen movies like that and the stuff and Return to Salem's Lot and you know that. Kind I just of- got announced for a Blu-ray too. Return to Salem's Lot. No kidding. Uh, Scream Factor, yeah. All right, well, that that's the excuse I needed, probably, to go back and revisit that weirdo movie. Uh, yeah. Which With is, Samuel Fuller. Yeah. <laughs> a, oh, man, that's such a strange film. Especially calling itself Return to Salem's Lot, and then it's like, what is this again? Um, it, Yeah, really interesting movie. But yeah, 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 by like, all, all means, everyone should go check out uh, all of the stuff that Derek just told you about, and... You know, this ain't the end of the road for us. We'll we'll have you back uh, sooner rather than later. Like I said, to to figure, uh, you know, one of these movies out. I'm not sure what we'll watch together, but we'll we'll find something. Um, got uh, a couple planned, probably through about August at this point, early September, as far as the schedule goes. And then yeah. looking at the holidays, we'll we'll start ramping up. I think now that we've talked about it, I think I think around the holidays there may be uh a a healthy amount of you know kind of classic hong kong horror that feels like a thing we ought to do for the holidays hong kong holidays um you heard it here uh, second and the <laughs> the other thing i want to mention to you, uh listeners and to Derek before we officially wrap up here um i just want to pause to say how heartbreaking it is that hong kong is kind of no more um yeah yeah i actually we actually did a shaw brothers retrospect on our studio uh we did a show on the shaw brothers we did a a, the kung fu show where we did a few of their like martial arts or swords and movies then we did a horror show and then the first show we talked about like you know like the it's desolate now it's like like they even had like the mask from one of the movies that we reviewed, like still in like the barren wasteland of this place that once was Shaw Brothers Studio, and it it was kind of sad. Yeah, well, you know, in the the Cliff's Notes version of the events of Hong Kong are that 
you know they had the the two systems one country approach after uh they gained their independence from england and then were sort of part of mainland china but also had their own system of government and over the past uh, couple of years that has all cracked down to the point that now basically mainland china uh runs hong kong you know that you if you speak out against the chinese government you're thrown in prison and all the stuff that happens in mainland china and uh as a result the the kind of movies that we saw coming out of hong kong are just gone we'll never we'll never see those again because the independent film studios of hong kong no longer exist they're chinese film studios now and and not that china can't make good movies but it's different you know it's not there, there was a culture of Hong Kong cinema that is just sort of lost now. I mean, we still have the movies, but there's never going to be, without, you know, independence from a, a communist regime, there is never going to be a resurgence of, like, the Hong Kong uh, style of movies that were kind of crazy and weird and wonderful. And yeah, like Cat 3, you know? Yeah, yeah, all that, I mean, all the stuff that, you know, it sort of lit my imagination when I was a kid, not just the Kung Fu stuff, but, you know, a lot of the, the hopping vampires and all that kind of crazy shit. Yeah. The, hum, the, yeah. the Sammo Hung movies, you know, like the all gone, you know? Yeah. And I just, I, you know, like I said, I just wanted to take a moment and, and at least shine a light on that, that, you know, they're because of the political machinations of, of, china and hong kong and their relationship to one another that you know there's there's no more independent free hong kong to make the movies that we all loved um and that's a bummer uh you know not to not to end on a bad note but uh you know it it was a thing that recently very recently um you know the china cracked down even further and are just no longer allowing any sort of free speech and that kind of thing within hong kong so um Anyway, it's uh, sad that it is it, time has passed on. For sure. Uh, but that said, once again, Derek, I can't thank you enough for joining me on a series that started off with three movies and then turned into three movies. And oh, by the way, here are 10 episodes of television. 